Welcome, friends. So glad you could join us once again. It's hard to believe that we're already midway uh, through August. And I know for our, our students, university, high school, elementary, that means back to school is just around. Wait, I'll stop right there. <laughs> so good of you to join us today. And I trust last Sunday was very meaningful to you if you were able to get out and join us in our prayer walk. And even if you were just praying from your home uh, in God's presence, that number one, um, God was real to you. You knew his presence as you connected with him. And as we continue to walk alongside our community friends, that God would be lifted up, that he would be seen that he would be made known uh, in the hearts and lives of the people around us, including our own. And that's what we're going to focus on today as we get into some very practical steps from Paul and his letter uh, to the church at Ephesus. And I trust today um, these very practical steps, they may be steps that uh, you have thought through before, but I'm hopeful today, friends, that as we look at them together, what in part we're going to discover is Paul presents what I believe is an important shift in the way that you and I think about our lives. And just to maybe say it this way, Paul endeavors to shift our thinking from the physical to the spiritual. And so today, may it be a meaningful time for you, may it be a meaningful uh, time for me. Yes, we're going to sing, and even as we're going to talk about a little bit later. Singing is good for the soul. In fact, it's a wonderful spiritual discipline. And so today we come together, yes, to sing as we gather in our homes, but also to study and hear from our Lord. Would you join me in prayer? God, today uh, we thank you for another day that you have given to us to gather like this to be connected with you, to again set aside some time to understand who you are and how you desire to walk with us as we live and as we will talk about today, as we endeavor to live wisely and what that means for us in our walk, yes, physically, as we physically take steps day by day, but spiritually in our soul care and health. So would you, Holy Spirit, walk with us this day, we pray. Amen.
you pick me up sing cause you're there I can sing when you hear me Lord when I call to you in prayer I can sing with my last breath sing for I know that I'll sing with the angels and the saints around the throne how can I keep from singing I do want to take just a couple of moments, friends, and just bring you some brief updates. Of course, you know we've been privileged to host Camp Wonder over the summer. The camps continue to go well. We still have uh, a couple of weeks left, so I want to encourage you uh, to continue to be praying uh, for the camps, be praying for our student leaders uh, that are on staff here, uh, that they would finish strong, that they would have the physical and the mental uh, energy to just continue to uh, be present for these kids and indeed through all that is shared as they come into this facility here at NBC would they experience Jesus make that your prayer today we also want to let you know that our community garden uh, continues to grow in the coming weeks there's going to be uh, vegetation that's going to be able to be picked and we're so looking forward to be being able to share that uh, with our neighbors here in the Nashwaxis area. So again, I want to say a heartfelt thank you to our volunteers who have put the time in to water it, to, to see it grow, and to keep the weeds away. Uh, we so appreciate your time and efforts. And so, again, these are just a couple of the things that are ongoing. Uh, if I could, just for a moment, come back to Opal uh, family services. We're going to be privileged this fall um, to host their youth. Uh, they're going to be connecting in with our youth on Wednesday nights and looking again, just another wonderful opportunity to be the presence uh, of Jesus. And we're also looking at the opportunity of hosting their kids clubs on one of the afternoons uh, during the week as well. They were here uh, this past year during the spring months, but we're looking forward again uh, to having them uh, with us. And so again, we appreciate your prayers and your support uh, in these endeavors like uh, contributing to the camp campaign for uh, the facility upgrades. I'm privileged to let you know that as I sit here today in the sanctuary, uh, I can feel the cool air uh, from the heat pumps. And so again, we thank you for your support and your ongoing support uh, as we continue to upgrade the facility and see it being used for the purpose of sharing the love of Jesus. Light of the world, you step down into darkness. Open my eyes, let me see.
to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. As I mentioned, friends, we're going we're gonna to shift gears a little bit here with Paul's writings to the church at Ephesus and, and move into some very practical uh, steps and teachings. You may recall a couple of weeks ago, as we looked at the first part of the fourth chapter, uh, Paul laid out in the first couple of ver verses some very practical steps. In, in other words, just some characteristics that you and I should be observing in our own lives as we endeavor to present uh, a spirit of unity in Christ and the peace that he brings. And today, Paul offers four, at least what I believe, and as I've studied over this past week and read uh, different scholars, listened to some different lectures myself, um, there's an agreement that there are four practical steps uh, that we can take. Now, I've termed them in my own way today, as I hope they would apply uh, to you and I, and we're going to unpack them together. And they're found uh, in Ephesians 5. Now, in Ephesians 5, and if you're familiar uh, with this writing of Paul at all, you know that um, over the years, in fact, over the centuries, it, it's been a piece of writing that can cause uh, some divisiveness uh, when it comes to understanding what it means in terms of uh, relationships between uh, a husband and a wife, and some of the early topics in the early part of the chapter, um, they're pretty deep. We're not going to dive into those so much today, but one topic in particular that we're going to begin with, I really believe, and I believe this was Paul's uh, thinking as well, and you'll see it as we read it, in, at least in our English translation, the way he ordered things, there's something here that we need to focus on uh, to begin with. Um, but before we go any further, I want to invite you uh, in your home today to speak these three simple phrases uh, with me as we prepare to hear from God's Word. The first is this, Father, forgive me. Go ahead, speak that right in your home. Let those words penetrate your heart. Father, forgive me. Secondly, Lord, have mercy. And third, Holy Spirit, speak. Holy Spirit, speak. And I'm sure like you, over the last couple of weeks, uh, you've been glued to uh, the TV and perhaps your computer, uh, watching the 2020 uh, Olympics uh, in Tokyo. And of course, congratulations to our Canadian athletes and all of the athletes who competed, and of course to those who medaled, and uh, again, uh, hats off to the ladies uh, as you uh, compiled uh, quite a, a medal haul uh, as we set a new Canadian record with 24 medals. So again, congratulations to you ladies. And I mentioned that this morning, friends, yes, to say congratulations to our athletes, but also in reference to the women and the success that they had, uh, you and I know that over the past number of years, the subject matter of equality has been one that has come up many times. And here in Canada, we, we have endeavored to uh, move forward uh, in that conversation when it comes to equality uh, between the sexes. And of course, this is something that has come out here and, and shining brightly uh, for our women in the Canadian athletes. Now, you might be wondering, what does this have anything to do <laughs> with our subject matter and the practical steps that Paul is addressing at the church at Ephesus. Well, very simply, 
Um, there's another phrase I want you to say out loud today. Uh, and if, you're, if you happen to be sitting uh, with someone, perhaps maybe your spouse and, and even your, your children or grandchildren, I want you to say these three, or I should say uh, four simple words. I submit to you. I submit to you. Was that hard to say? Was that hard to get off, to roll off the tongue? Paul speaks very plainly uh, in verse 21 of Ephesians chapter 5, as we have it in our English translation, uh, when he says, be subject to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then again, as I mentioned earlier, if you're familiar with this writing, you know that in the next verses, he lays out some very clear instructions for husbands and wives. How we are to move into this act of submission. Now, I want to start there because as we back up and look at verses 15 through 20, we want to do so in light of this act of submission out of reverence for Christ. You've heard me say many times over the past year and a half how Jesus is the center or needs to be the center of everything that you and I are, everything that you and I do. That is to say, in our actions, in our speech, everything flows out of Jesus at the center. He is at the focal point of our thinking. And that's going to come across in one of the points that we share and discuss in today. To be able to come to that place and say, I'm not number one but also in having conversation with our neighbor. To know that when we have those times and spaces of disagreement, and remember, Paul already addressed this earlier in this letter when he talks about keeping the peace at all times, this spirit of unity. In part, how do we do that? In submission. It doesn't mean that we always agree, but it means that we're willing to listen openly to other people's opinions on various topics and matters of how we walk in life. And so, with that in mind, I just want to very briefly, I want to give you these four practical steps, and then we're going to unpack them together. The first one I already mentioned in our opening prayer, and that is, live wisely. Second, be filled with the Spirit. Third, sing from the heart. And four, give thanks. David Drury says, um, we need to examine our lives in light of the mystery. And of course, the mystery that we're talking about here, this mystery that was revealed to Paul, is the wonderful work that Jesus has done, what he has accomplished. And as Paul uh, shared that revelation uh, with the Gentiles, what became very clear is that this wonderful work, this wonderful love of Jesus, was to be shared with all people. It wasn't just for the Jews. That is the incredible mystery that is being made known. And a question that comes out of verse 15, and I want to ask it to you and I this morning, that is, how are you and I walking? The New Revised Standard Version phrases it this way. It says, be careful then how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise what Paul is laying out for us here, he's letting us know the foundation. He's reminding us that the foundation we build on, we build on the mystery of what Jesus has done. And I want you to catch what I say next. It's not for our physical benefit, but it's for a spiritual battle. It's not for our physical benefit. It's for a spiritual battle. Friends, the foundation that you and I build as we center around the love of Jesus. It's for our spiritual health. When we battle in life, when we battle the unknowns, the hurt, the pain, the suffering, it's spiritual. It's what connects us here in the heart, deep in our soul. The Greek word uh, for the word wise is sopho, and that's S-O-P-H-O-I. And I appreciate the words 
of Dr. William Taylor when he says, committed to the truth of God. Committed to the truth of God. And I think what Dr. Taylor is getting at, and even to come back to what Paul was trying to express to the people in Ephesus here, is that you and I, just like they did some 2,000 years ago, we need to be able to clearly understand and articulate the gospel. You may recall back in Ephesians 4, um, when we talked about some of the spiritual gifts, and he mentions specifically the roles of preachers and teachers and the role that they have, someone like myself as a pastor to you in a, in a local community setting like this one here in Nashwalk Sis, part of my role and my responsibility is to equip you to clearly understand and articulate the gospel. That is to be wise in our thinking. So if I could be so bold today to ask you, can you clearly articulate the gospel? That is, can you clearly share and state the wonderful love of Jesus? Not only what it means to you, but how it has changed you, how it continues to shape you. And I want to confess to you today that if you're struggling with that, I'm here to help. That's a part of my role as we work together as the body of Jesus in this local church. And I say that in a state of confession because if you're struggling with that, I need to do a better job at that. And one of the ways that we are practically going to do that, friends, and one of the reasons why we have invested in a resource like Right Now Media is that so coming into the fall, we can learn together, we can read through these studies of God's Word to better equip ourselves and understand and articulate that message. And I want you to know, friends, that I'm here for you to help you do that. Paul goes on here and he says, um, he talks about, um, at the end of verse 16, he says, because the days are evil. Now I want to just stop right there. I think you and I would be in agreement that here as we live in the 21st century, uh, there, there's evil in, in, in the world. There, there's things that are going on uh, that are not right. There's a number of injustices taking place all around us right now as we speak. They are evil days. But stop for a moment and think to Paul's writings here. And this is where I love how God's Word penetrates through the centuries. Now think about this. We, in, we would probably be in agreement that these are evil days. But Paul was not writing directly to you and I some 2,000 years ago. He was speaking to the people in Ephesus, a busy port city, about the evil days that they were in, the evil days that they were experiencing. And yet, some 2,000 years later, you and I can relate. And so then, how do we go about living in a place like this? Well, I appreciate um, Pastor J.D. Greer. When we look at verse 16, he says, we need to be intentional with our time. Now, when looking at the original Greek for that word time, there could be two possible ways in which the Greek word or words here may be used and may be interpreted. I think what we need to draw in here when we talk about being an intentional in our time, we need to understand here, and again, the New Revised Standard Version says making the most of time. It's recognizing that you and I, friends, right here, right now, and you've heard me say this many times over, make the most of opportunity the opportunities that we have in front of us to share the gospel, to share the good news. And then he goes on in verse 17. He says, don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. In a very practical sense here, what Paul is saying, he's not talking about just doing God's will, but understanding it. How do you and I go about that? Let me share another 
uh, some other words of Paul. You may have heard them before. Um, he says this to the church in Rome. He says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. You see, what Paul is saying here and also saying back in this fifth chapter uh, to the church at Ephesus, to understand God's will is to allow God by His Spirit to transform our minds. To say it another way, friends, to allow God to transform the way you and I think about life. And that is why Paul, leading up to this point in, these fir in the first three chapters that we were studying a few weeks ago, this foundation that we build upon, that is why, friends, Jesus is so central. And He is to be, needs to be, the center of how our thinking flows outward when we have Jesus at the center. And then Paul goes on to express it in verse 18. He says, Do not get drunk uh, with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, what I want us to catch here, friends, is the contrast that is taking place. I don't want us to focus so much about just you know, whether or not we, we, should, we should drink alcohol or anything like that. That's not what Paul is specifically wanting us to think about here. What he wants to drive home is what's controlling you and I? When we're in those, those difficult days, those moments of pain, and we're looking for something to numb, to dull the pain that we're experiencing, what are we filling ourselves up with? Is it substance or the Spirit? Let me ask that again. What are we filling ourselves up with? Is it substance or the Spirit? That is God's Spirit. I appreciate what Todd Wagner, um, Pastor Todd Wagner that is, he says, the question is not can you have more of the Spirit? The question needs to be can the Spirit have more of you? In other words, we don't need to get drunk or intoxicated on something that's going to take our focus off God. If we are truly going to allow God to transform the way we think, then we need to spend time with Him. We need to focus and build upon that foundation that His Son, Jesus, has left for us. Psalm 111, verse 10 says, Fear of the Lord is the foundation of true wisdom. That's the first part of that verse. When we talk about fear, we're not talking about being afraid, but rather being in awe paying respect to our Lord who is the foundation. And the Lord is our foundation. He is wisdom. You might recall the words of Jesus. Maybe even, um, for those of you, maybe you remember in, in, in days gone by, maybe you went to Sunday school, maybe you heard a song like this. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. And on it goes. And what that Sunday school song talks about in the words of Jesus, he talks about where's your foundation? Is it shaky? Is it on sand? Or is it truly on solid ground? And so then how do you and I, how is it that we become more filled with the Spirit and that be our focus and not something, not a substance that is made by Humanity to null or dull the pain. Again, Paul gives us practical steps in the very next verse, verse 19. And our third point in terms of living a practical, healthy, spirit-filled life, singing from your heart. Verse 19 says, As you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts. I love this picture. And being a musician, being 
Uh, being a vocalist, I, you know that I, I love to sing, and I love hearing you sing when we can gather uh, together in, in public places uh, and make a, make a joyful sound and make a joyful noise uh, together unto the Lord. But what Paul focuses in on here, he reminds us that this is very much a spiritual exercise. It's something that helps us stay focused on the Spirit. But also know here that he says, um, I appreciate the phrasing of the New International Version when it says, we are speaking to one another these psalms. Again, to come back to J.D. Greer, he says, you and I are rehearsing the promises of God. If I may be so bold, let me ask you a question. Even amongst uh, your fellow, uh, your fellow uh, Christians, that is Christ followers, do you rehearse the promises of God? Do you share them? Do you express them with one another? Those promises that you read in God's, God's Word, in those times uh, of pain, right? Those times of suffering when they're hard. Are you there for each other to rehearse them and remind one another of those incredible promises? You know, just this week, friends, um, on a couple of a different occasions, I was very clearly reminded of one specific promise. And that is God's presence. Yes, it's eternal. Yes, it's for the future. But it's also present right here and right now. The psalmist reminds us that we cannot hide from God's presence. He says, where can I go? If I go to the heights, you are there. If I go to the depths, you are there. And friends, for me this week, that has been a promise that I have truly been clinging to as I've walked through a very couple of uh, difficult uh, situations uh, in my own life as I've been walking with some, some dear friends. We also uh, discover here, and uh, it was Dr. Uh, John Drury that brought me on to this, and I appreciated this being a musician. He phrased it this way in verse 19. He says, we need to be in tune uh, with each other. I don't know if you've ever tried to do this, um, you know, have one person, you know, playing a piece of music. Maybe you're listening to a piece of music and they're playing it in one key. And then there's another individual has another instrument and they're playing it in another key and they're playing at the same time. And you're like, wait, 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 wait. It doesn't, it, it, it sounds awkward. It's called, uh, in musical terms, that's called bitonal. Two tones happening uh, at, at once. They don't, they don't fix. They don't, they don't gel. And again, to come back to Paul's earlier words talking about unity, I appreciate Paul's words here in verse 19 when he talks about uh, singing psalms and creating spiritual songs to sing and share with one another. Why do we do this? So that we can be in tune with each other to be in tune with God's Spirit and what He's doing, the work that He's doing in around us. And then fourthly, as we do this, we give thanks. Verse 20, giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We need to remember that we need to give thanks for what Jesus has done and continues to do. And may I come back just for a moment to this idea of submitting to one another. Francis Fuchs says, pride of position and the authoritarian spirit are destructive of fellowship. Let me say that again. Pride of position and the authoritarian spirit are destructive of fellowship. Friends, as you share together in your homes, as you gather with friends and neighbors, as we continue to open up the province, are we willing to put others before ourselves, to enter into those conversations where we may not agree, but endeavor to come in a spirit of unity, in a spirit of peace, to sing together, to give thanks together. Because as we do that, we live wisely and we make the most of the opportunities that God has set before us as he continues to renew his wonderful 
mystery. The mystery of being filled with his spirit so that we can truly walk in step with him. So that when we face those spiritual battles, when we face those unknowns, we know that God's presence is real right here. Be free. 